Welcome back to another episode of Chalk Talk. Last episode, we got to meet Ricky Igbani, who's been working a lot on our speed and agility programming and instructional videos. This week, we bring on Coach Brez for more of our EDU-style podcast, but we are going to stick in the same vein of talking about speed and speed training. So we're going to keep talking about it, especially with summer workouts coming up and lots of us starting to get geared up for that type of workouts and speed in general. So we'll go ahead and get started. This is Chalk Talk presented by Platform. Let's go. All right, we're going to kick off this episode with Coach Brez talking about speed training. And as we always do with Coach Brez, we like to get right out in front with some definitions because sure. there's lots of things that can get convoluted and kind of spin different ways. And I think sprinting and speed are words that get thrown a lot around that are sexy words in the world of strength and conditioning and training and athletics. But we want to make sure we're all on the same page as to what it is we're talking about, like most topics that we discuss here. Yeah, um, speed is something that uh, I don't think anybody would disagree um, is one of those aspects of physical performance that every single athlete is seeking um, because it is a pretty key performance indicator uh, within almost any um, athletic competition, right? Um, and there's been plenty of studies that you know literally connect the dots between um, you know you're more likely to score in your given sport, you know, if you're faster, right? Like they've done studies that correlate the two. You're more likely to um, have successful athletic careers, so forth and so on. It makes sense. We all know that being fast is an advantage. Um, the the thing is, what we do need to do is talk about, you know, what is speed, what does it encompass, um, and then what what goes into training for the improvement thereof. Um, I think most often um, speed is kind of uh, boxed into one very specific area, which is just maximum sprint velocity, um, which is an obviously an important thing. So your top speed. So if yep. you just get up to um, and maintain it, it, your top speed in um, a sprint, um, but there are a little bit um, kind of, there are some layers to sprint uh, or to speed, excuse me, especially when it comes to team sports that are part of the puzzle and we're, we're, is worth kind of like peeling away the layers to see what goes into speed training, not from just a, hey, we want to improve max speed. We want to increase the speed quality um, that goes into athletic performance. There are kind of a few different things that we want to look at um, as it pertains to actually training for those improvements. Yeah, and I think that's probably where we get um, a lot of kind of caught up or questions about because we think about speed and we think about just like more so the max velocity stuff, the stuff of like how how – fast can somebody move like truly like top end speed thinking like Usain Bolt like mm -hmm. holy smokes that person's bounding um, but there's a lot of elements within athletics in particular that we might not always consider or athletes might not always consider in terms of the layers to working that skill and working that piece of training and I think we're going to get into those um, for the sake of kind of that holistic picture, if that's the way we're going. Yeah, and, and I, I want to say right off the bat, what I'm not saying is that the, you know, consideration of top speed being the, you know, singular quality of speed with regards to performance training is like, you know, not important. It's wildly important. It's a yeah. big piece of the puzzle, but I think there's more to it. I think your example of Usain Bolt is ex extremely apt because a lot of people, I think, get caught up in the, I don't want to say, maybe more track related yeah. um, side of things where straight line, linear, top speed race yeah. um, quality movement is what everybody is seeking. There's a few reasons for that. One, it's obviously a big component of speed in a, a, a larger sense. Two, it's the easiest thing to measure, yeah. right? And it's the also the thing that has probably the greatest amount of background research and practical application because of track and field as a sport. Yep. Right? You, you can find ways to improve those things. Um, I would argue though that speed, as we're gonna talk about it today, goes beyond that. That is a pillar of speed uh, performance, um, but I think we wanna look at it a little bit broader. And I would argue that Speed isn't just how fast you move, it's how quickly you get where you're going. Yep. All right, because in team sports, anything other than track, um, it's a bit more involved 
the fast person on the field isn't always the fastest on the track, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think both ways make a lot of sense in that we can all picture it, right? Like, let's say all of a sudden we're flying down, let's say, soccer field, and the ball goes a completely different direction. If your linear speed is fantastic, but all the other pieces aren't necessarily there that you're about to get into, then that speed isn't as good. It's not serving you the same way. And I think that's where talking about speed training will get into those different components Mm -hmm. as opposed to just talking about like point A to point B linear speed. Yeah, just the athletic application of speed I think is super important. Um, So we'll talk about kind of the the different layers. And again, I I should just say maximum velocity is one of the biggest, but it's just not the only. Absolutely. So outside of maximum velocity being one of them um, yes. that we've talked about, what are some of the other things to consider within that like umbrella of speed training? Um, I think first would be acceleration and deceleration. So, um, you know, most sports, you're not you know, given the opportunity to work yourself up to maximum velocity. So, for example, and uh, not to get too far into the weeds here, but it's worth understanding when we say the difference between max velocity and all the other elements of speed, even Usain Bolt takes somewhere between like 40 and 50 meters to get to top speed. And it's very rare that an athlete on a team sport um, or in a team sport environment has that opportunity to work up to top speed more than a couple of times. And it's not irrelevant, but it's not the thing that kind of governs all of their movement on the field. So acceleration and deceleration is the ability to um, go from no speed to top speed as quickly as possible. Yeah. So if you can reach top speed faster than everybody else, you're in obviously in a, a better situation. If you can just achieve a greater percentage of top speed faster than everybody else, you're in a better position. Yep. But I would also argue that the flip side is um, similarly important. If you can, we've all seen these athletes, if you can um, run at top speed faster than everybody else, but the moment you're asked to stop that movement, and change direction, change type of movement, or just simply stop, they fall apart, right? They, they become a little bit ungainly and, and out of um, you know, coordination. Then you are less useful in your given, again, you know, team sport environment. So acceleration and deceleration, stop and start, is just as important. Yeah, I think acceleration, max velocity are the ones that probably make the most sense because they stand out. You know, you look at a 40 yard dash, that we always use as an example of, you know, things that are broadcasted on NFL combines and Mm -hmm. everything else like that. People are working up, accelerating, but we're not so much focused on what that next component looks like in deceleration. But if you're moving at top speed, being able to slow yourself down or stop on a dime is another one that sometimes people refer to safely, but also efficiently. I think efficiency is one of those big things in athletics that we forget about is like, how can you do so in terms of like, coming down to a stop because the like I said the ball changes direction or whatever and we'll get into change of direction as well mm-hmm. but just the fact of slowing yourself down is a, another piece that we don't always think of because we're thinking about kind of the other end the cooler part of it yeah it, it, it's it's the the less sexy part of call it change of direction which would I be which is what I would pose as like the next uh, piece of uh, speed training that's uh, often, like we kind of we we call it agility, but it's not really trained appropriately in the agility sense. Um, and you know, sometimes we we do call it correctly, change of direction, but we're not you know approaching it appropriately. Change of direction within speed training should really be about applying proper acceleration, proper deceleration with top speed when appropriate for more athletic application of all of those pieces. Um, And, you know, we've talked the the difference between a true agility, reactionary or reactive agility drills and closed chain uh, change of direction drills. Right now, you know, we're really only talking the closed chain because I think that's probably the first best step because you need to learn how to do those things in a controlled environment and then maybe apply them in more um, reactive, kind of natural, organic environments. So um, either one, it's somewhat interchangeable, but I think it's a super important piece. Now you get a lot of it in your sport, um, but that's why I think, you know, closed chain, learning how to change direction in multiple multiple planes, you know, running linear and nonlinear and kind of utilizing all those pieces and trying to apply your developing speed, acceleration and deceleration in uh, kind of the full package is important to do every step of the way as well. Yep, yeah, so that's perfect. We have 
acceleration, max velocity, deceleration, change of direction, which is a, another one that almost sometimes goes hand in hand. You have to slow yourself down before you move a different direction, forward, back, side to side as well, all of those different pieces. Um, what about just in general, like being able to do it repeatedly or being able to at the end of a game, perform those same things that we're talking about. Yeah, look, I, I would be remiss. We won't dive into this element in any detail because we talk about it at length other places, but um, I, it would, I would truly be remiss not to state that speed training as it pertains to team sports is hugely impactful and important. However, if it doesn't also come with some element of work capacity, whether it's repeated sprint ability, building aerobic base and anaerobic capacity such that you can you know, operate at a higher percentage um, over the course of a game, then your speed to some degree is no longer important. Your maximum velocity, if you can only achieve it once when fresh, five times when fresh, is not super, super important if you're not able to do that at a relatively you know, high level for a long period of time. Right, and again, um, it's different when we're thinking truly track. Like Usain Bolt absolutely. has to do it once at a prelim, once at a final. Yeah. And that happens in a much more like controlled, closed environment. But when we're talking larger athletic scope of different sports, different tasks, different things, we always talk about like, what can you do in the first quarter versus the fourth quarter? What can you right. still perform over and over again in that endurance piece? I think certainly comes into play. Yeah, and we're not saying you have to grind uh, athletes into dust and 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 you know condition, 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 so that you're you know the fastest in the fourth quarter. You know, working your speed works towards the same goal. Yep. However, you need to have both sides of the coin. So you know, before we dive into the elements of purely speed improvement, speed endurance is something that should also be considered an important part of you know preparing for a season, so that an athlete can use all of the things that you've developed you know, in a field of competition when it matters most. Yeah, for sure. And one more just to throw at you, um, and I don't know if this would be considered, I know we might get to it as we talk about training speed, but something to just consider with all of those in terms of acceleration, deceleration, change of direction, uh, would just be general mechanics of all. Um, maybe we'll get to that later, but I just find that a lot of times we think just go do it without learning it as a skill. Uh, yeah. um, yep. And the mechanics of it and like learning actually how to properly move your arms, move your legs, what do you do, I think is sometimes a forgotten piece of the puzzle. We just assume that people know how to sprint like, like they know how to breathe because we've all raced as little kids and everything else like that. But once you start to layer in some of those things, I think it adds in another element of understanding that much like many other skills, it has to be broken down, slowed down, and go over mechanics of each piece. Oh, big time. And that, that will be one of the kind of the pieces that we talk about with regards to, you know, how do you go, um, go about improving speed, you know, call it in the gym or on the field, um, and technique and mechanics is a big piece. Um, I think it is important to mention, though, because um, it's weird. There's like a very divergent opinion um, on the mechanics piece. One is it doesn't matter just you know run and run fast your body will figure it out there's the other that says if you're not maximizing the exact perfect sprint posture you're going to completely miss out on the boat um i would say it's probably somewhere in the middle and most specifically because of who we're talking about i have kids even as freshman junior freshman sophomore junior uh in high school football players that when i watch do a simple like high knee warm-up drill don't even know which arm goes with which leg for most proper locomotion of movement or swing at the elbow wildly. Like there are things that you can make a pretty large impact on with very simple mechanics without getting into like full blown stride, foot strike, you know, torso lean analysis like yeah. you might do in track. Yeah, and I think that's fair. Mechanics, I'm even just talking about like- The basics. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think that's fair. Before we move on to training all of that, mm -hmm. let's just probably quickly talk about one of the larger elephants in the room of, you know, speed and everything that comes into it. Like, is there a certain element that is just genetics and just, you know, I think we've talked about it before in terms of strength and power and everything else like that. I think the th same thing we've mentioned in terms of speed is sometimes, you know, just being fast is because you're naturally faster or just because, you know, your body type or the way you train. I don't think I'm ever going to become Usain Bolt, right? Yeah, I, it is. Look, I, I think your question is a good one because for some reason and mostly because of the money involved, speed is one of the things that 
everybody has this belief that they can all of a sudden be transformed into something that they're uh, they're not, like on a wholesale basis. Yeah. Um, where speed is like any other quality in the gym. You can improve your speed ability. You can't, I can't get a group of 30 kids to all run a 4-4. Yeah. Right? Well, I can't get anybody to run a 4-4 because those are more or less a myth. I can get, I can't get them all to run a 4-6. I can get each of them to improve by... I don't know, 10%, which is a very large percentage when you're talking about, you know, speed on a field within a play, within a game, et cetera. However, <laughs> there is a genetic, there's a genetic, uh, you know, role to play. Fast is fast. Yep. Like not to be that guy. I was going to be fast no matter what training program I did, but could I maximize it or, um, you know, minimize, you know, my potential is up to the, the training program that I pursue. I was never going to be a very strong upper body individual. That's just not the way I'm built, but I was fast. Yep. Right. And like that, that's just the kind of the same thing that goes into, oh, you got some kids that can squat the house, but they, they aren't fast. Um, you got some kids that can jump through the roof, the others that just don't have that vertical jump ability, um, but you can improve any one of them. For sure. And I think that's good in, into the context of not selling so much, you know, like you said, sometimes things are sold. I'm going to get you to this speed. I'm going to get you that. I think within the context of each individual, there's lots of areas to improve everything else like that, which is a perfect transition into training it. And mm -hmm. we talked about acceleration, deceleration, all of these different components of speed training. But before we get to the actual working on those things as potential skills or on the field or on the track or working those things, I think it's worth mentioning overall the stuff that can be done in the gym as well to develop speed training. That it's not going to become the focus, hey, Summer, we're not even going to go into the weight room. We're just going to work on our speed because we want to be fast. And that's exactly why we have to say it because not unlike the whole, everybody thinks that they can be ch transformed wholesale by speed training. There are a lot of people that believe that the single way to improve speed is only through on the field, cone, turf, sprint, drill, and work. Yep. And that is a very valuable, important element. However, um, you know, there is a massive argument to be made for the fact that you know, if you really want to improve your, your speed, your change of direction, acceleration, deceleration, and all of those elements, the weight room strength and power training is one of the single biggest influential um, ways in which you can change those qualities. Um, we know that, right? Like the greatest improvements in sprint performance following training have been shown to come from combined method training programs that include sprints, but also plyometrics and weights with heavy loading, moderate loading, and light loading performed, rel um, you know, the relevant uh, velocities. So while we will dive into the pieces of, call it, what people think of as speed training, going out on the turf, grabbing some cones, so forth. That's what we're gonna talk about. However, if you really want to improve speed, if you really wanna maximize return on investment, it needs to be done in conjunction with Heavy loads move slowly, think all the strength training that you do. Uh, lighter loads move faster, think only lifts all the way down to plyometrics and ballistics and all the work that you do in gym. Even some of the hypertrophy work that you do is beneficial for sprinters, not least of which is if you're a sprinter that's not just on the track, right? So all of those things play their role and it's a big role. Yeah. So making sure that you understand that what you do on the field should be done in conjunction with what you do in the weight room is probably a, a really big caveat before we talk about the things that you can do that do have a role to play. Yeah. And I think we get into that on a lot of other episodes and I think probably that's a, just a good precursor to the on the field stuff, especially because uh, none, not even to mention like a lot of the, you know, work that we do in terms of injury prevention and all mm -hmm. of those other things that happen in the weight room and right. can only be done under load or with, you know, different, you know, strength and power exercises and movements and everything else like that, that can then allow us to better develop absolutely on the field. Right. Um, so if you're okay, we'll transition to the field work because yep. I think that's where some people uh, are interested in talking a little bit more about. And I think before we get into um, talking about the different elements of it, because we said, hey, a lot of this stuff's already happening in the weight room or 
where does it actually fit into like how much time are you doing this and you know oh, good question and like when is it done before weightlifting after weightlifting because i think we'll get into what it actually looks like but are we talking it's every single day for an hour a day or you know how, how much of it are we actually talking about before we start to go into the details oh, it's a great question it's one actually i didn't even think of before this chat so i'm glad you said something um it's it's pretty simple. No, you're not. You, you shouldn't be doing this every single day, right? Um, if we're talking on the field, uh, you know, sprint slash speed training, a couple times a week, two is fine. Three is fine. More than that is a bit too much. You need like 24 to 48 hours between true sprint speed sessions um, to recover and and you know do it so safely again. Um, so I, I look at it as probably two times a week. It should really never come after a weight training session. It should always come before. Um, the reason being, you can think of sprint training like you think of Oli lifts or plyometric or ballistic work. It's the super high velocity, super high intensity, low volume work that requires like the absolute best from your central nervous system. Uh, and that's why all that stuff always comes at the beginning of a workout, yeah. right? So even if you were just in a weight room, all of those things, plyometrics, et cetera, would happen at the beginning. Um, and then you would move to kind of slower and slower movements with higher and higher volumes. So when you think of speed, um, it's going to be low rep, it's going to be um, high intensity, and it should come before anything else that you're training in that given day. Um, so if you do happen to do it on a day that you're working in the weight room, perform it before. It can also be a great warm up, right? Um, if you're gonna do it on an off day, absolutely. But yeah. just make sure you give time in between so that you can recover. Yeah, and I think as you get into this, it's important to mention like we're not talking about a conditioning session. We're not talking about, you know. You in know, no way, shape, or form should it ever feel like conditioning to kids. Yeah, and I think that's where I myself have been in practices as a athlete you know, way back in the day where I felt like, oh, we said we're working on top speed, but now all of a sudden I'm huffing, puffing, right. and just basically trying I'm to moving make slow again, trying to make an interval and moving slow. I think what we're talking about, and I just am over exaggerating. Yes, we it, should hammer it home for to, sure. To hammer home is we're talking about developing like that top end speed, that top end ability to change direction efficiently mm -hmm. and to be able to do all that really well. Yep takes also some built-in breaks, some built-in rest periods and everything else like that. So, so it, and I only throw that out there too and that's why I asked the question do. because, you know, I, it makes sense when you throw it out there. If we're truly trying to develop like, hey, how explosively can you change direction? Yeah. Having gone through a full hour long weight strength and conditioning program, might not be the perfect then transition to be like, all right, let's go do it on the field now for 20 at, to 30 minutes. At best, you're not gonna be operating at the percentage you want to to yield results. And at worst, you're, you're probably jeopardizing um, health because you're, you're, you're at risk for a greater strain because if you're operating at you know 95% or 100% speed, but you're fatigued, that's, what, that's, what in, that's when injury occurs in games, right? Yep. So I, I think of it like this. Um, if, if you think of true speed training you should, and if you're familiar with weight room stuff, you should think of pure speed training like um, plyometrics and med ball throws, ballistics. Yep. That's the, that's the type, the approach, the volume, everything. Perfect. Yep. Conditioning that is absolutely important, like we said, should be thought of like your finishers, your body weight, longer volume, slower, less intense, same timing, it's at the end versus the beginning, you know, that's how you should think about the two. If you want to do speed, think plyos. You want to do conditioning, think finishers at the end of a workout. Those two things will get you what you want if you think of them that way. Yep, that's a good delineation. I was waiting for the Sam Breslinism of you got to make the main thing the main thing, but mm -hmm. you didn't say it. So, All right, uh, sorry. you got to make the main thing the main thing. The main thing today that we're talking about is speed training, so we'll transition now into the components of yeah. what that looks like. And so if you've got your 20, 30 minutes, you don't need really a lot more than that to go work speed before a workout on an off day, whatever. Um, you know, I like to think of it as there's, you know, call it five, um, you know, elements that we think of when we, you know, program for, for speed. The first is, uh, and I'm not considering warming up for it um, uh, to be one of them, but technique, as you mentioned earlier. And as I said, I think there's a kind of fine line to walk as to not get too bogged down in details, because if you want to go become the best absolute track athlete you could, 
track coaches can spend hours working on pure mechanics and that's great, but we don't really have the time for that. It's not necessarily the, the audience that we're working yep. with. So it's just maximizing. Are you, are you moving proper with a, you know, any, uh, without major losses of energy in your, you know, kinetic chain, foot strike, knee drive, torso lean, arm action. And those are things that you can do relatively simply and just kind of work patterns over time. And they can be part of your warm up as well, which yeah. is nice. Yeah. And I think those things is simply put is there's a lot of, you know, over the years not to go down the rabbit holes, ways that people have even been told to use their arms. Um, and even that, like I, I know for one, there are a time or two where I'm flailing my arms every which way. That's not efficient, not really the way you're supposed to be doing it, but I just think that's the way. Yeah. And I think grounding down those basic technique and mm -hmm. mechanics go a much further way than thinking like, you know, some of like the nitty gritty that you mentioned if you had hours upon hours upon hours. Right. Uh, so the next one probably moving past technique would be acceleration, power. What about those components? Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, there's a couple different ways that you can do acceleration and power development. So the rate of force development. So like your plyos, et cetera, but we're doing it in a more targeted environment. So um, you're looking to train um, individual you know, foot strikes or arm action or whatever um, to produce as much force as physically possible, as fast as physically possible. Um, so that can be as simple as the, you know, lean up against a wall, bring a leg up into that great knee drive, and then you are stabbing it down as fast as you possibly can into a proper foot strike. You are looking to basically, it's almost like a snap down. You know, how quickly can you get from one side to the other? Um, you can do that in multiple different variations. Um, there are a lot of other, you know, power skips and bounding, you know, it's the same gamut of all of the plyometrics you might do in the gym from very high, you know, specific singular action to kind of continuous rhythmic action. Yep. Um, uh, and then, you know, you can also um, do it in a more uh, or less targeted environment where you're saying, okay, we're going to take the entire body. We're going to start you in a stationary position and you have 10 yards to get from zero to top speed or as close to top speed as you can possibly get. So it's taking all of that force that you created in the gym, the you know rate of force development that you create in the gym slash through these power drills that you might do on the field, putting it into action. And I think that's the important point is you might create a lot of the force and even rate of force development improvement in the gym. You have to go use it. And your body's only gonna be able to use it and improve upon it if you go out there and operate at maximum ability. So yep. 10 yard sprints, do it from a variety of starting positions so that all parts of the kinetic chain are working in that, hey, we need to get from this chin angle to that chin angle. We need to get the arms moving as quickly as possible. We need knee drive to happen as quickly as possible. We need to keep the torso angle correctly. Those are the things that you can do. And you're gonna, you're, it might be six reps of a 10 yard sprint, but you're gonna rest really well in between. You're gonna set up super intentionally. And when we say go, it's I am all out for yeah. 10 yards. It might be one second of work, but it's one second of all out effort. For sure. And so, you know, that's where we kind of combine all the things that we're, we've done on the field or in the gym into acceleration in the most practical way, which is literally like, can you go from not running to running full speed? Yeah, for sure. And I think that one is cool to think about, again, thinking about the practical applications to sport, what you were just talking about. Like you don't always get the opportunity to set up in your perfect starting position. Right. Thinking about the different ways that you can have to start or have to move or have to get up to, you know, that acceleration and, and moving quickly. Um, not just always like in the exact position that you want and right. design for. On the alternative side of things, you know, we already mentioned acceleration. I think um, a word that I learned in being the behind the camera person filming with Ricky and was braking. I'd never even heard of braking, um, sure. which is another one that you can look to develop as its own individual skill yeah. um, and practice it from that speed training perspective. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think it's more skill than anything else. Although there is a lot of eccentric, you know, especially posterior chain loading when you break, it's like landing on a box, landing from a box in a depth jump, catching a weight on top of you in an Olympic lift. Um, all of those things we're also going to work on the field, but I think more important is truly the skill of learning how to, um, 
work against your own momentum, absorb the force. Technically, that's not even true, but you, you get the sense of what I mean. Um, and the reason I say it's a skill is because if you've ever gone out and tried to do run full speed, and I want you to stop at that point in this position, yep. the first time you do it, it is wildly uncomfortable. Oh, and yeah. you can almost never do it with any grace. Yep. Um, so it's something that you can absolutely improve over time. I, I challenge anybody that's never tried it to just do a, a lateral shuffle and stop at a designated point in a, an athletic stance that allows you to move in any direction after it, you will feel so unathletic at anything other than the slowest speed possible at first. Yeah, and I was going to ask, because that was my follow-up, We I asked about the mechanics beforehand. Is there merit to doing these things at 50% speed, 60% speed, like oh. learning how to do it slower before just trying to go top speed in the Always. shuffling? Always. I would say that almost anything other than your actual sprints, like we talked about with acceleration, maybe your 10 yards, as we'll talk about with some of the other things, they should almost always be performed at 50%. Yeah. Because we're working on economy of movement. So are you able to do the most with the least? Um, and are you able to do so in a way that allows you to then move or exert yourself in any direction at any intensity that you want. And you can't do that if you're just kind of all over the place. Yeah. And as you know, learning how to do something new or just perfecting or, or refining a movement or set of movements or just general movement pattern, you can only do that super well if you're doing it slow. Um, if you try to do that when you're running at full speed, you never really can do it the way you're intentionally trying to. Sure. So um, starting slow at a minimum, if not always working slow, and then allowing you know, our later change of direction drills is when you might apply them in a higher intensity environment. Um, and it, it is, uh, yeah, coordination first, intensity second, I think is the, the, the way to go anytime you're working the deceleration piece, but um, it's a good question. Perfect, and I think um, that type of stuff like you said, is that idea of working at it kind of coordination and you mentioned and used the word skill. I think it's not always, again, we think about like speed and that top end speed is something that's like athletic and raw and you think that it doesn't come with some of the pieces in the building blocks below it. Mm -hmm. And I think deceleration helps paint that a little bit um, and, and show those side of things. So. Next, we'll actually just talk about it, is that max velocity, that, mm -hmm. that place that we picture in terms of the, like, how do you actually work on feeling like your full speed? Like, right. there's not just, hey, go run as fast as you can. Like, how do you structure that within a training environment? Yeah, and it's a good one because if you think about it, you want to get strong in the back squat. You have to work up near 100% of your ability in a single rep or yeah. whatever to improve. And the same thing goes for your actual top speed. But as we've said, it takes quite a while for an athlete to work their way up to full speed, even if their attempt is to start at zero and sprint as fast as possible. Um, and you know, enter the conversation, flying 10s, flying 20s, flying 30s. Yeah. They're all the rage right now, and for good reason. Um, essentially, all you're doing is allowing athletes to build up to a, a specified window of distance um, that you say, hey, the goal today is to get six reps of this 10 yard, 20 yard window in which that entire window you are at top speed and maintaining top speed throughout. Yeah. And the only way to do that is if you allow them to build up to that first, you know, call it that gate, that wicket, that, that cone and carry it through. And so a flying 10 is literally just a 10 yard, um, uh, marked off space in which you allow the athlete to warm up to um, basically start at zero and just kind of jog, jog, sprint or stride, 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 and then hit the cone at full speed. Um, that could be 10 yards, 15 yards, 20 yards, whatever they need to build up because every athlete's a little bit different. Yeah. And I think that one is, is telling because like a lot of times when you hear sprints, you're just like 20 yard sprint, just go 40 yard sprint. But as you mentioned with acceleration, it takes a lot of time to actually get up to that full speed. So the flying 10s, flying 20s, flying 30s, I think illuminate that and that we're more so focused on the middle part yeah. of often what it would be. Yeah, the rep is really what happens between the cones, but it's also important to understand that 
it, you might prescribe a flying 10, but they're actually covering 50 yards worth of uh, distance because they have to build up and then they have to cool down appropriately instead of just stopping on a dime because as we said, that can be relatively risky. Yep. Unnecessarily risky, I should for sure. say. For sure. Um, and so max velocity is certainly something that you can um, work on very, very specifically. And then what I would put underneath that is um, taking that that flying 10 and that 10 yard sprint at a station, starting with a stationary stance, putting the two together. Let's actually hit some 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 yard stationary two full speed sprints because again, none of these things are only important in and of themselves. They all have to work together. So, you know, all right, we did max velocity and acceleration one day. Now maybe we're gonna put the two together and we're gonna do 20, 30, 40, and 50 yard pure sprints. We're gonna combine acceleration with max velocity for, call it, total speed. Yeah. Um, and I think those are just as important because it combines the two. Um, and just like you can't only go into the gym and learn force development, you gotta go out and apply it. Well, you can't just learn acceleration, you can't just learn max velocity only, let's apply the two together, which then very well segues into, well, great, but how often are you running only full speed, only one direction um, for long enough that any one of those things is singularly important. Yeah, and I think that's a perfect transition to kind of the last one that we haven't been yet to talk about as much of change of direction, because I think that, to your point, is not often are you just getting to work up to a full sprint, be in full sprint, and then cool yourself down appropriately. A lot of times you're being tasked in, ath in athletic settings, I'm saying, to change direction, slow yourself down, work to a full sprint, change again. Like there are all of these different like pieces of an equation which makes sports a lot of fun, which make those types of competitions really fun. But training that is kind of now we're playing with like a little bit of a melting pot here which gets us into change of direction. So we've talked a lot about that linear style but there's also lots of other things that we could be thinking of. Yeah, there, there's tons. And, and you know, I don't wanna just kind of sandbag it and say like there is just a lot out there that you could utilize and it's not all that more difficult, all that much more difficult than utilizing common sense. I mean, you can start as simply as uh, like we talked about that lateral shuffle to a stop, learning braking. Okay, let's just progress that. It's now a lateral shuffle to an intentional stop, but without completely stopping, we're gonna transition and sprint in the opposite direction. Yep. Or, and again, that might be what we do, and then we might, a platform, and then we might say, okay, we're gonna shuffle, and then we're gonna sprint, and then we're gonna sprint again. You could very easily, just, just as easily say, we're gonna shuffle, then we're gonna sprint, at a 90 degree angle. We're not gonna sprint where we came from, we're gonna turn and go a different direction. Yeah. Um, and it's just figuring out how can we create a total, um, you know, kind of map of all the different potential situations that athletes find themselves in uh, that might be useful to have had practice in, um, learn a little bit more uh, efficient way of moving and applying it at slow, medium, and then high intensity speeds, and I think one thing worth noting is, you know, if you're somebody that, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're never going to work in that exact environment. Well, we're, we're just looking at, you know, universal patterns. So it's not, doesn't have to match your sport exactly. Um, second of all, you just need to move in multiple planes, lateral, linear, forward, back at an angle. Um, because as anybody that's played a sport, uh, that's walked into the first day of, of preseason camp that has only done straight ahead running, the next day your hips are ruined yep, because yep. you just haven't used the musculature for all of those different movement patterns um, and directional uh, work that I think is worth doing as you lead up to a season. Even if you're like, well, we're, I'm not, I'm not going to make a linebacker better by you know, doing lateral change of direction. Okay, fine. But you're going to do a lot of lateral movement. They should probably be prepared for it in some way, shape, or form. Um, so even if you're just not sold on the rest of it, I think it is an important piece of, call it, you know, athletic preparation. Yeah, and I think that athletic preparation piece is a good place to sort of wrap up, is thinking about kind of the things that we're able to connect together to allow people not only to move safely, but you said do it so that they're efficient, they have good, uh, I believe you were movement economy, what was the Economy word? of movement. Economy yeah. of movement, I love that term because it like kind of puts into perspective, you know, all of the ideas are only as good as the total ability to perform them at different times. Yeah. It's not about, hey, 
that one time you perfectly nailed it, but the 99 other times you were flying all over the place, you tripped over your feet, or you didn't know what to do here. Like it's building towards that picture of what we're always kind of working towards is that athletic development, mm -hmm. that development of being able to do things safely, efficiently, and effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, bottom line, there are just a few things to, to follow. First and foremost, we talked about it in other podcasts. We didn't, we didn't like harp on it today, but if you want to train speed, it needs to be divorced from conditioning. We mentioned it a little bit. We've talked at length what that means, work to rest ratios, intensities, volume, and so forth and so on. They're both important, but they can't be done at the same time. Yep. Um, and so, you just need to make sure that you, you at least have the purpose that you're out on the field for defined well um, before you get out there. Then if you want to truly impact an athlete's speed, you first have to consider what you're doing in the gym. It can't be only field work. Can you improve speed with field work only? Yes. Are you going to get anywhere near where you could? No. You are also at some risk if you don't include strength training, um, it's something like, uh, I, I put a note somewhere. Um, the, the pers oh yeah, so if, if as, as you get faster, or rather, if you, as you operate at higher and higher velocities, say sprinting, your body needs to be able to sustain like three and four times your body weight in force. And so if you haven't done any strength training, you're putting your body through something that it might not be prepared for physically. Sure. And that's where that injury can occur. Yep. So just making sure that you don't only think that, hey, if we just sprint, 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 we're going to get faster. And it's not you know important to be in the weight room. You got to do them together. Um, and then when it comes to on the field work, there's just a, you know, a few buckets that you want to hit, do it two week, two times a week, three at the most proper rest in between, because you're, it's more akin to super heavy weightlifting or high intensity plyometrics, ballistics, Olympic lifting work, yep. um, than it is anything that you could do regularly every single day. So High intensity means more rest, means you know, frequency has to be determined by day on, day off, day on, day off type of thing. Um, and just you know, hit those buckets from technique to acceleration, um, power recruitment, uh, or, your, or rather you know, rate of force development, um, you know, max velocity, change of direction, deceleration, all of those things you can kind of put the pieces together, take 20, 30 minutes, go out there, make the most of your reps. It should be, feel like weightlifting, not conditioning. And I'll just say that so that you do you know, you don't, you know, overtrain kids. It's more, if you're not, if it doesn't feel like a, a heavy weightlifting session where it's all in, then it's rest, it's all in, it's rest, you're not actually going to get the speed gains that you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's hard for high school um, students to yeah, put it in perspective because they're sitting there kind of twiddling their thumbs or whatever else it may be. Uh, and it's hard for coaches too. I, I know I found myself talking about speed training, you know, in the pool, you know, it, there's a lot of transition for us thinking about, all right, you have to be patient and work on the parts that matter and break them down and be disciplined enough to know like, hey, we're not going to be go, go, go for a full hour, right. hour and a half, two hours, which can be hard to divorce yourself from right. if that's what you're used to yeah. uh, and what's been your traditional model. And I think important and, and I think encapsulated by this conversation of thinking about those different pieces that lead to that full athletic development. Yeah, I think that's a great, great sum. Awesome. So perfect place to stop. This is coming out in conjunction with a new speed um, and agility program, basically within the same time that this gets released, that'll be out as well. But as always, if questions come up or things kind of spark your interest in different topics or areas, please reach out, explore what we've come out with, with Coach Brez um, coming behind a lot of the thought process of everything with Coach Ricky Igbani, who's been working really hard on all of the instructional videos that are going to go with these programs mm -hmm. and all of the great assignments that come with it. Lots of great stuff coming out, but obviously we want to put it within context of a podcast and talking about it a little bit more. So we'll wrap up. Thanks again for listening, tuning in, and remember at Platform, it's always in pursuit of better.